All right, uh, so the Gilmore Gang is a conversation that started with uh, John Udell and a few other people uh, on the phone about six years ago. And it's morphed uh, over time into a uh, loosely ranging conversation with uh, people who have, uh, some of whom become extremely well known and some of whom become less well known. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the members of the gang, uh, 2009. Come in, Gilmore Gang. Hello. Go. Kevin Marks. Jack Dorsey. <laughs> Welcome. Please. All right, I'm going to have everybody say who they are. All right. And uh, Mike, why don't you sit there? So we'll start with uh, the chairman of the board, Mike Arrington. I, I am so glad I'm up, because it, it looks ridiculous from the audience to be one of the guys like lined up on the couch. I'm just glad I'm lucky enough to get the chair. But, uh, I'm Mike Arrington. I'm the founder of TechCrunch. So happy to be back. It feels like it was just yesterday we were on stage doing a Gilmore Gang talking about uh, stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which has been documented. But no, no wine this time, right? Yeah, I screw up, screwed up completely the wine. Okay. Uh, I have to say, last year I think year that we had might wine. have been a good mistake that you made there, uh, to stay away from the wine. We're, we promise not to be quite so belligerent as we were last year. Maybe. Uh, Gabe. I'm Gabe Rivera, TechMeme.com. All the hottest tech stories at a glance on a single page. Uh, it's good to be back. Um, I'm Paul Carr. You may remember me from such panels as two minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Andrew Keen, the author of Cult of the Amateur. And please, everybody, hold the uh, mic right up to the chin so that we can hear you. Andrew. I'm Nikolai Nahum. Um, until yesterday, entrepreneur. Today, I went over to the dark side, VC. Uh, Jack Dorsey. Uh. Can we have uh, Jack's mic, please? It's a uh, lavalier. No? All right. Jack Dorsey, co-founder and chairman of Twitter. Kevin Marks, you saw me two minutes ago. Um, I'm Loic. I'm Loic and I, I helped my wife organize a conference called The Web. Uh, so so uh, th this, this uh, conference is what? 30% uh, bigger than it was last year? It's uh, 30 to 40 percent. We were 1,700 last year. We we're uh, 2,300 this year, and it was 35 countries. It's now 50 countries, and 200,000 people watched on Ustream today. Unique. I just got the stats from Ustream. 200,000 unique viewers. We have, uh, when I left, it three to 4,000 right now, and uh, 100,000 yesterday. It's just amazing. So, uh, Jack Dorsey, how much bigger is Twitter uh, than it was last year? <laughs> Uh, much, much larger than it was last year. Um, this, this year was a, a very big year for the service and, and for the users in terms of, of defining what Twitter is. Paul Carr, what do you think about Twitter? Do you use it? Um, occasionally. Sometimes at conferences. And uh, what, what's your take on this conference? Uh, um, I remember yours last year. You can was look it up on Twitter. I, uh, I use the hashtag always. Um, my take on this conference is it's, it has Wi-Fi, there's food this year, it's really freaking warm. So, you know, I <laughs> consider that a triple win. Oh, and there were some speakers and panels and stuff. All right, so uh, I want to say a couple words about what I think uh, Twitter announced the other day. I thought it was pretty spectacular. And uh, if any of it comes true, I think we're in for uh, a good ride for the next year. Uh, specifically, the uh, un bundling uh, the fire hose and making it available to all developers. Uh, what is it that took so long to get there, Jack? Um, well, I, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's not just a, um, it's not just releasing the service, but there's, you know, before there was a lot of technical challenges in making the, the fire hose, quote unquote, un available to people. Um, so I think the, the company and the team have done a fantastic job 
at further scaling Twitter a bit where we can actually start thinking about offerings like this. Um, and it, you know, it's a, it's a constant evolution and iteration as well. So um, it's something that uh, I think you'll see a lot more activity on. And I'm really excited to see what people build on top of it. So uh, this should enable track to come back, right? Track, track could come back. Um, now, most people say, what, or I don't care. Do you care about track? I, I love track. It was, it was one of my favorite features. And Can you describe it for uh, the? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's very much like what you see on search.twitter.com today. Um, it was a live search engine that would uh, push any match of a keyword out to SMS or to IM. Um, we had to shut it down pretty early because we just could not figure out how to scale it just then, and we were focused on other aspects of the product. Um, so it's, it, it was very useful um, to create these filters on the go, uh, and, and I, would love to, I would love to see that happen again because my favorite, my favorite way to use Twitter is through a mobile phone, and particularly through SMS. Mike, you said something? Uh, just the way I always described track was it's Google Alerts for Twitter. Right, I mean, it's Google Alerts are so important for so many people, and and having the ability to do that for Twitter was so nice for the very brief period of time that it was it was online. So, you actually said that you think I think you said we could or Twitter could relaunch Track. Do do you think Twitter will relaunch Track, or with the hi fire hose will they rely on uh, third parties to create their own Track? I'm I'm not really sure. I mean, I imagine that a number of third parties will, will jump on the opportunity to, to do it and, and you know, provide a really intuitive and well-designed product experience around building these filters. That's, that's the hardest thing, because even with track, you can get overwhelmed with information. My, my favorite word to track um, when it was live was champagne. Um, and anytime someone is talking about champagne on Twitter, there's a celebration. Why? <laughs> I just said. Um, it, it's just, they're, they're always happy messages. There's always some sort of celebratory aspect to people mentioning champagne and or rooftops. You know, yeah, but that, you know, that, that's the other problem. Rooftops could right. be bad if it's a suicide related tweet. Uh, it, that's, I think that's champagne true. Po possibly. But that's true. Um, but even with that, even early on, um, you know, you could, you could easily get overwhelmed with messages mentioning champagne. So I think creating the filters is really key. Um, and, and providing an intuitive way to, to create that, like the iTunes Smart Playlist, um, would, would, would you know, solve a bunch of problems. But as a communications medium, that's what I thought Track was really about. It's about the ability of anybody on the planet to be able to talk to anybody else by essentially signaling them with a, either an at reply or a lop that off since... Uh, yeah that's been eternally damaged by Twitter. It, it, gets, it gets down to you know, the essence of, of what Twitter is for me personally, which is not necessarily about the following relationship, but the fact that any particular one tweet can create an entire community that's, that's there just for that one purpose and then can dissolve when it's no longer necessary. So the fluidity that it provides and real-time search provides is, is huge. Um. I mean, I could talk about this all day, so uh, <laughs> we should go ahead, Kevin. That's OK. It's the last panel. We can do three hours. No, no one's listening okay, at this excellent. point. Oh, I can push back a bit. I think the reason track worked when Twitter was small was that it was small and you didn't choke on it too Closer much. Closer to the mic. Closer, OK. The reason it worked when Twitter was small was that it was small. You didn't choke too much on the flow, whereas now you'd probably need some other filters as well. You may need a, a regional filter, a friends filter. Um, a, t a temporal filter or something like that to make sense of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Now we have some metadata to do that, but, and that, that may be possible. But uh, sitting there on the stream and watching every, every mention of the word champagne go by would probably choke you now. Absolutely. Just, just look at what's going up there with the hashtag web, and you can see that that's probably just about too fast to read. Gabe Rivera. <laughs> now's, now's your time to say something. Uh, I like track too. I miss it. Uh, it's uh, it's not you know if if the fire hose is really open uh, to all developers, it doesn't matter if Twitter launches track because there'll be a great track service out there, and then uh, we'll have we'll have better Twitter interfaces that update immediately, like web interfaces. I'm sure you know like the fire hose will allow Brizzly to instantly uh, send over your uh, 
your, your tweets if they don't have the firehose already. So what if uh, Brizzly gets bought by uh, uh, Facebook? Then it's going to be OK? That's not a question for me. Well, I mean, the politics of this, I think, you know, the, I've explored that considerably. Uh, you know, uh, there was an acquisition of a, a small company that I can't name anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, friend feed. And, uh, <laughs> and it had uh, a, a really uh, extensive ability to filter. It, it was pretty much the most uh, explicit uh, negative filtering that could go on, which I think is what we're really talking about here. And uh, it's been basically ha hampered by the rate limits that were also part of the announcement on, uh, uh, what was it, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, if uh, a company is bought by a, a major competitor like Facebook, uh, how does how do we know that this isn't going to essentially devolve into an arms race of some type? Uh, well, I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's an open conversation and, and something that needs to evolve and it, it needs to happen on a case by case basis. And, and the company, you know, right now um, is faced with a lot of policy decisions. And I think, um, I, you know, I think we're doing some, some good work there. Um, but it, it's something that, you know, requires a lot of feedback, a lot of correction constantly, and, and there's not going to be any one single answer at any one point in time because, you know, the, the, the market outside of Twitter and Twitter internally is, is changing um, all the time. So, uh, you know, I, I, it, it just requires some thinking and, and some, you know, open conversation. But, but isn't, isn't that where the, uh, the fire hose now allows for... Can you hold the mic close to so, your Sure. Mouth? Isn't that where the, uh, the fire hose now allows for democratization? You know, so you're not going to actually get into that situation or it's very quickly going to be broken up. Yeah, uh, that, that, that seems to be the spirit of the, of the announcement. So, yeah. All right, well, the spirit... Uh, but the, well, the, the deeper question there is how do you actually make this work in a way that isn't um, chokeable by one company? And the answer there is to, to come up with open specs for it. And, you know, I, I know I beat that drum every week, but that's the point. The point of having open standards for the web is you can interoperate with someone without even knowing they exist, let alone having a business deal with them. And if you shut them off subsequently, then it's clearly you're acting maliciously. Loic, you're, uh, uh, you have one of the major uh, Twitter clients. Are you looking forward to integrating uh, track with the, the, your basic services? And if so, how are you going to do it? Well, we're uh, really working hard on the filtering because we have obviously the issue with all our users who want, you know, to be able to have higher quality. And the way we do it is, is really by filtering what we have. Uh, like Seismic Web caches a lot of data, and it's growing very nicely these days. And so we'll be able 10% a week right now. So we'll be able to, uh, for example, tell you what's trending among your friends, or we can also create a track ourselves independently from Twitter with, with their approval because we work very closely with them and we store that data with their approval as well. But we can, we're being a web, having a web-based client and all the server architecture that we have does, you know, create something interesting that we're not only a, a client anymore, but we're also able to create our own track. So we're working very actively on it. Okay, uh, I think I've beaten this horse a little bit too much. So I want to shift to what I think are uh, the major issues that I don't know if they're coming out of this conference, but certainly out of some of the conferences that TechCrunch has done in, in recent times. Uh, and, and that's the issue of the web OS, uh, the, the web operating system. And I think that there are two candidates, and a lot of people don't really agree with uh, uh, one of those candidates, I, uh, I don't think, but I would say that the it basically is breaking down into uh, uh, Chrome OS, uh, the Google uh, strategy, uh, the so-called open or HTML5 strategy, as it is also called, and then uh, Microsoft's uh, Silverlight strategy. Uh, Mike, what, what's your take on, uh, uh, on those two uh, strategies? Are they, gonna, are they gonna coexist or is there gonna be a, a winner? I think uh, uh, Google has been uh, less than transparent on whether they will allow 
Silverlight into Chrome OS. So the thing about Chrome OS is that uh, you cannot download software to a computer that's running it. You'll have the browser cache, of course, for images and things like that. You can change settings, but you can't install Silverlight. You can't install Flash. If Flash doesn't come pre-shipped, then you won't have it. Um, Flash is coming pre-shipped, um, but there are a couple of question marks. What about Silverlight? What about Skype? Right now, Skype requires third-party, I'm sorry, a, a download beyond the browser, and, and so it's, it's up in the air. Google has actually said Skype something they might build in if, if Skype can't get it sort of built in the browser more quickly. You mean a, diff a different version of Skype? Well, they might Could ship Skype uh, for Linux on, on these, you know, with a sort of code base. Um, we're not talking about Skype, we're talking about Silverlight. Uh, it's clear there's a war between Google and Microsoft. One of the battles being fought is over, over uh, what happens with you know, Silverlight and did I, where did I say the battle? There was a war between Google and Microsoft, and one of the battles is, is over Silverlight. Uh, I think most people, uh, including me, think of Silverlight as a Flash competitor um, and, uh, and a way to uh, run rich uh, internet applications uh, you know, be outside of Flash. I, I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if anyone really understands Silverlight to the depth you do. I mean, you seem to be able to look ahead and see you know, Silverlight as an operating system that you know, is eventually going to transplant even Windows. Well, I mean, it, and I don't, I don't understand how, where that's going. It, it's clear that the Windows Presentation Foundation, which is sort of the underlying uh, you know, service fabric of uh, Windows programming, and Silverlight are merging together into a single, uh, I mean, it, they say that they're being done by two separate teams, but in fact that's uh, largely not true, and in fact uh, th they're, they're coming together. Ray Ozzi, a couple of weeks ago, uh, someone was uh, criticizing uh, the name Windows Presentation Foundation, and, he's, and uh, he and I both simultaneously, uh, whereas, you know, me saying it doesn't mean anything, but when the chief software architect of Microsoft says, well, just rename it Silverlight, you know, there's, this is something that's happening. And uh, Bob Muglia, who's uh, sitting next to him, was sort of blanching because, you know, the, this is where they're going to go. The question is how fast. So if that's true, that you're going to have an operating system that runs through the browser on the Mac and the PC, and through an uh, open source implementation, uh, Moonlight, uh, you've got something which, uh, as we move into the social media layers on top of it, is going to be uh, where the developer uh, issues are, are being fought. Uh, Jack, you, your company just announced uh, a developer uh, event uh, and uh, a developer site. And you know, basically, this sounds like uh, you know, Steve Ballmer, uh, 2009, talking about developer, developer, developer. Uh, isn't that what we're, uh, we're moving toward, is people choosing between the stacks uh, that are available from the major competitors? Um, well, I mean, in, I think in our own conference, the, uh, you know, the, the, the desire is to get people further talking about, you know, how to develop applications and how to develop in the ecosystem of Twitter. And, and, you know, the thing about Twitter is it's not, you know, it's not exclusive to anything. It, we, you know, we seek to merge and, and be a connection between many points on the web and many points on the internet. So um, I, think, uh, I think it's a good, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a good meeting point for building technologies that, that band, you know, all technologies together on the internet. So um, to me, you know, that, that would be the spirit of, of that conference and hopefully we can see a lot more like that, including including this conference. Well, your strategy with Square uh, of using the audio input, which is common across all the different mobile platforms, that's what we're starting to see. Uh, this is a, a rush to, uh, you know, I mean, what happened with, uh, with uh, Firefox was that the What Working Group, I mean, Kevin, you can address this, uh, there were a bunch of developers who decided to essentially stub out IE uh, and create a sort of a base best practices of the Internet Explorer browser and then build, uh, you know, libraries that talked to that level to build on top of it so that they could normalize across all the different browsers. This is a strategy that I think we're starting to see. I mean, what, as Mike said, what we're seeing with uh, the official uh, discussion around uh, Chrome OS is, is that they're not 
publicly they're saying sure, but privately, evidently, they're saying no way is Silverlight going to be on the, in that environment. So, uh, I mean, this is going to be. <laughs> well, so I can address bits of that. I think there's a sort of fuzziness here between what you mean by an operating system, because when you say web OS, you're basically you're basically going up a level. The web is an abstraction that sits above operating systems. That's part of the point of it. I can run the same. I can run browsers on, on this device or this device or your phone and see the, see the same web substantially, as long as we're writing to the web standards. The challenge is extending those standards to new domains. Um, when Jack's writing a, um, a square driver for a different system, he's got to call the audio input driver. That will be different on each system at the moment. That isn't standardized at the web level. You can't say, um, record a piece of audio and give it to me um, in HTML yet. Um, so you, you have to go down and write something at the lower level that sits on the real operating system. Right, but when all, the, when so all the that's is, done. Standardize some of that operating system stuff a level up. And that, that's gonna, where it starts getting interesting. Um, and there's, a, there's, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't believe that Silverlight will be it. I think Silverlight is an extension of the Windows model of one company owning everything into, into this realm. Um, and that has scaling problems. That means that it can't run on other devices um, because it's proprietary code. So they have to do the port. If they want to run it on Android, they can run it on Android, but they've got to port it to every Android. Um, and the, you know, for Google to put it into Chrome would mean that effectively Microsoft would have to fully open source it. That, I can't see that happening. That, that will be the cultural battle there. Um, but what, I, what we have seen at this level is that at the level sort of in between the two is, has been um, the WebKit browser foundation from Apple is what has replaced, is, is what's become the glue for uh, many of these operating systems. That's what we're seeing um, on iPhone, what we're seeing on Android, what we're seeing on Pre and a bunch of other devices because they open sourced it. Suddenly the way to build a platform is not to hire thousands of engineers, sit them in Redmond and say, port this to everything. It's to say, write, write a good browser, open source it and see where it goes. And Apple was very far sighted in doing that um, and uncharacteristically so in some respects. All right. So. Uh on the panel, how many people uh, have iPhones? Yes. Who doesn't have an iPhone? Okay. I, I, I can lend you mine. I have you two want. iPhones. I just don't use them. Right. So you're on Android, and you're on Android. Okay. Androids, yeah. Uh, Loic, you're you're placing bets on Android. What do you think is going to be the uh, uh, outcome a year from now in terms of and Android penetration? I. Uh, I think it's going to be huge. Um, the app, app Store has more than 100,000 applications, and Android has already more than 10,000. The Android App Store. Right. No, I know. But I was just, you know, I was just asking you, is that what you mean? I was just giving some perspective in numbers. Um, obviously, as a developer with my Seismic hat, we're uh, in the, I think, the top 20, whatever, of most popular social application on Android. And you know, one thing I, I really liked is we had a little bug when we launched it, and we corrected it a few hours you know, after we were able to push something else. So as a developer, I think it's going to be huge, because there is a trust that is being created with Android. Um, and now I also think uh, we shouldn't underestimate the capability, the capacity of Nokia with its Sophia store to fight back. And that's probably here my uh, European uh, leg that is, uh, you know, like Europe and US, but we don't see Nokia much in the US, but here there is a lot of Nokia, and I think their latest 900 is really cool, and it's exciting for developers. So it's a huge company, it's gonna fight back. So next year, I think we'll have three huge app stores, and that's gonna change a lot. As developer, it's, it's great and horrible. Horrible, and I'll, I'll stop here, it's great as an opportunity. Um, easy to reach hundreds of thousands of millions of users, but it's a catastrophe because you have to code three different things. So you have to code for Apple, for Android, and for uh, Nokia. That's three. So bad. how did Nokia... But Seismic Web works on all of them. Um, yeah. Okay, let's put Nokia aside for a second. I think, you know, we could also talk about Palm, we could talk about Microsoft, we could talk about Blackberry, which are, I, I think all three of those companies are more interesting, at least what they have out right now than what Nokia is doing, at least in the US, from my point of view. But I think Android's interesting less, uh, I think Android's interesting, but for two reasons that Luik didn't say. I, I'm less concerned with how many apps are in the App Store in a pure count. Uh, the apps I need are on Android and that's all that matters. Um, I like Android because Apple is sort of, is starting to get caged in or hemmed in by their own fear. Uh, 
They're afraid of they're afraid of voice in particular. They're afraid of letting people really experiment with the iPhone and do whatever they want. You think they're, they're afraid of it, or the carrier that uh, they're with they, is afraid They, whoever, you know, I uh -huh. think we'll see if some of the same carriers like AT&T start allowing things through other phones. We'll figure out. But you're you're going to see the carriers do exactly the same, Mike. I right. mean, you're going to you're going to see Google Maps disappear from the Verizon or somewhere else, and right. You know, so you're so going to have same kind of, of limited. Um, no, we're not. You. But but I'll say that, that even if we are, what really is interesting to me about Android isn't Android; it's Google Voice, and so uh, it just so it reaffirms the fact that when I come here, I take my Google Voice number, which is my main cell phone number, and I don't have to worry about the fact that I mean, my Droid doesn't work here because it's not the right kind of phone. Everyone's iPhone does. That sucks for me. Uh, but I have something better. I just get, log into Google Voice and I reassign my phone number to point to uh, a cheap unlocked phone uh, that I have with me and it rings here, but it also rings a VoIP phone that I have plugged into my laptop uh, through Magic Jack, which is a really cool sort of Vonage-like service. And pretty soon it'll be able to point to my, my hotel phone uh, even if they have to go through an extension. And the portability of the number and the ability to point it anywhere to me is, is just so amazing. And I know Ribbit's doing some things as well. And I'm, I'm on Google Voice, Eric Schoenfeld, my co-editor's on Ribbit. And, and, and so you guys are doing some things in Europe as well. But it's just so powerful. And I don't know how Apple can compete with that when they seem to be afraid of their own uh, success. Well, I, I'm not sure I agree with your assessment that they're afraid. Uh, Nikolai, the, you come from uh, the area of the world where uh, some of the mobile strength, I think uh, in an earlier panel there was discussion about, uh, you, you told me about uh, Nokia, Ikea, you know, that there's a climate of innovation that's coming out of those, uh, that sector. Uh, what do you attribute that to and, and do you think that uh, Nokia's roadkill like I do? So let, let's address the first point first. I, I think that a little closer to the mic. yeah. Okay, so I, I think that you know the reason why stuff like um, um, and actually the one thing I really 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 like about the Android is 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 the, the part about infrastructure, and that's just exactly what Mike's talked about right now. You know, um, what 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 really I think favors a lot of Europe, and especially I'm going to be biased here in Northern Europe is uh, is the level of infrastructure, level of design. You go to the British Isles, you'll see the plumbing outside. You, get, you start moving into the continent, you'll start, start seeing things working. And, and I think that, <laughs> I think that, that very, very much, I, I think this is what really has, has pulled companies like Nokia, like Ikea, like Sony Ericsson, um, sort of in, in, into the mainstream. And, and it's, it's what's allowed these companies to evolve to a to state that they are today. Whether they can take the next step, you know, I think you know, taking the change from rubber boots into mobile phones for Nokia, I think was was pretty easy. You can just discard the past. The 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 move they have to make right now is really fucking damn difficult. Um, I'm not sure they can do it. They have some absolutely brilliant people sitting, especially um, there's a lot of them sitting in Berlin uh, working around their their version of the uh, WebOS uh, MIMO for the N900 and what they're going to be rolling out across the N series. But it's, it's you know, can they get this infrastructure thing uh, um, free? Can they, can, they, uh, can they free themselves of the operators somewhat? I'm also, I'm uncertain whether Google can do that. You know, is it, if, if Google can make Google Voice work for O2 or 3 or whoever it might be, it's going to work. But if they're going to sit there and, and try to dominate the space themselves, I hope it's a provocation that they're giving to the operators. Andrew Keene, pick up your mic, please. Uh, I mean, you're a newbie to this, uh, this world. You, you wrote a book which was basically, I'll let you characterize it, but it was somewhat negative about uh, uh, the power of uh, open networks and uh, uh, you know, user-generated content, et cetera. Uh, and now, six months a after uh, I told you to get involved with Twitter, you're uh, you're knee deep in Twitter. I see you posting more than I do. So, uh, do you see that the, these kinds of uh, seemingly random uh, consumer technologies are are are, 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 are they going to move rapidly? As what Mike's talking about, uh, which uh, he's a geek. I mean, he you should have seen him on. Just on, look at him. You should have seen him on the on the on the gang last week or a couple weeks ago. He was knee-deep in plastic for like the entire hour. 
just ripping these things apart so that he had the uh, ability to be able to call from the door of his uh, hotel room uh, and no further. Uh, do, are we seeing uh, something that's going to get translated to people like you that uh, are, are trying to see whether or not this is something that's important in your life? Well, um, I was in Brussels last week and all the talk there was about antitrust against Google. And what I'm hearing here is what Google's, I mean, ke ke you see that even uh -oh. Gary, uh, what have you done? But Kevin talks very uh, idealistically, or in my view, in a very ut utopian way, about openness. But the consequence of all this openness is Google obviously dominating search. I think it got 90 or 80 percent of the market in Southern Europe. Now you're talking about them having the, the dominant OS system on, on the web. Now Mike talks about them being very strong in mobile. So I think one of the ironic consequences of all this openness is you have a more and more dominant company. You know, in Brussels, everyone's talking now about Google acquiring Twitter. I don't know if that's true, but it wouldn't be surprising. What happens if they do? Uh, you could ask Jack. He's just sitting there. Well, I will. <laughs> is it true, Jack? <laughs> there, there have been no announcements. Yeah. <laughs> there have been no announcements. I thought you were going to say uh, that you have no intention of it being what a, what a ridiculous question you should have said. What do you mean there have been no <laughs> announcements? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And this is when it happens. <laughs> okay, if you insist. <laughs> no, seriously. I have never seen someone look so uncomfortable in my life. Is this something you no. want to announce here? No. Um, no, uh, Twitter is focused on building a sustainable company. Yeah, and, that's uh, the yeah. one. Moved right yeah, I heard that yeah. one. <laughs> right. So, um, I mean, seriously. Uh, why would you answer that question that way? <laughs> it, just, it just came to me. I don't know. You're just lulled into the, a false the sense new of security. The president needs a little bit of marketing. He's signed up with Twitter to get the <laughs> message out. But I would, li I would like Kevin to, because I, I, he's always picking on me, so I can pick on him. Fair enough. What, what is your what's, response, what's Brussels Kevin, source to, um, you know, you are this, what, let's, this, let's this into evangelist the of I'd openness. Like to. Can we just go right back yeah. to the Hey, Google you opened part? up this yeah. huge uh, opening there, what Andrew. What is Brussels? Sit back and What is this. the source of well, I Brussels? I can't give you any, I can't give you any sources, but I'm saying... <laughs> Who's your Brussels I mean, A lot of right? people I'm talking to, they're all discussing the same issue. Maybe it's because it's me and they, they know I'm not keen on Google, but... Um, Were they discussing this in Belgian or English? Because you may have misheard. <laughs> <laughs> Is there even a language of Belgium? I don't even know. Yeah, is Robin here? Well, no. I don't. It's like it's Flemish, right? Belgium. I don't believe Belgian is Belgian's not a language. No. Does Robin Belgian even French. exist? I you live in Belgium. Have you heard this, Robin? Our TechCrunch correspondent. Are you his from Belgian deep throat? Have you told him this? <laughs> well, the line Belgium is, is, is saying that, that you're lying, Andrew. The, the line is, is that the Europeans were the only people who could take on Microsoft, and now they seem to be the only people who will be able to take on Google. Well, yeah. <laughs> you can always impose government fear to prevent stuff, sure. But I'm not sure what the, what the question is. Um, the, the point about openness is that you can take advantage of it by doing, by publishing your software and then other people can build on it. And Apple, as I said, Apple did that with WebKit. Um, Google has done it with a whole bunch of software. Um, and part of that is understanding that that can work. And the other part of it is a different kind of culture, a culture of speed of development. If you're an operating system company for conventional computers, your speed of development is measured in years. Um, if you're a commercial software company, your speed of development may be measured in months. If you're a web company, it's usually measured in hours. And that is an enormous difference. Yeah, but you're not answering my question. My question is... What was the question? The, the question is, is you have this cult of openness, right? <laughs> Democratization, blah, 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 all these other invented words. But what it's all resulting in is that more and more of dominance of Google. One company is coming out of this culture of openness. You can all, yeah. There's can a I, can, about, Kevin, the, can I just make one yeah, comment? Is it, you, you talk about antitrust law, at least in the US. Uh, being big and even being a monopoly isn't a bad thing. Uh, it's just an indication of winning. Uh, the problem is when you use that power to, to do bad things is when you get into trouble. Uh, to, to some extent in the US, you know, we, we feel like when U.S. companies are successful, uh, you know, Europe goes after them more as an ATM machine than or what we call a cash machine, uh, and just a way to sort of beat up on them for political reasons than, than because they've done anything wrong. I haven't seen Google do anything. Of course we do. 
that I would consider to be evil on a large scale in Europe. Is there something that we can point to? The sort of the scale that Microsoft engaged in in the 90s? I think there's a lot of fear that they, uh, they are acquiring so much power, particularly in terms of the amount of data they have on individuals, that potentially they could, particularly if you've got different kinds of people in power. Um, I think it's good to be wary of that, of anyone of centralizing too much power or too much data, which is it, the same do thing. Do they scare you at all, Mike? I, I'm, I'm I, you know, the last few years, I've really shifted my thinking to where I'm not just saying privacy is dead. Privacy really, really is dead. What and does that mean, privacy it, is it dead? Means that, it means that not only is our data uh, insecure in, in, in terms of everything, there is no private life anymore, in my opinion, but, but also that I'm just, it's just clear that people are going to misuse that data, uh, starting with marketing and advertising to me, but then in other ways as well. Paul uh, wrote a, a column on TechCrunch about these the, uh, services like Foursquare uh, that, and now Gowalla that are, are just blowing people's personal physical privacy to, to bits because people are checking in in people's homes all over the world, all over the country in the U.S. And so suddenly you do a search for Paul's address and you know, his this home is why I live in hotels. Up. This is precisely why I live in hotels. I just keep moving. So you're saying that <laughs> privacy is dead. So the more private information Google have about individuals, it doesn't really matter. I'm just not sure that there's any way to stop it, whether we well, stop Google or not. I'm not sure also the question is who has it, right? If at the you know, location data, the, the cell phone companies have had it, the, the government has had it, that's been true for a long time. Well, I think now we're starting to get it ourselves and we can do things with it. Um, and the, the question is, are we going to do better or worse things with it than the cell phone company and the government? And your answer to that question depends on your basic view of whether you trust people or not, or whether you trust government or not. I it it ends up with a, the basic dichotomy there. We're, we're giving away a lot of our data. Though. I mean, like, the difference between the cell phone company is you assume that the numbers you call are private. We're, what Mike's talking about as well, though, is you and your friends just breaching your, pri breaching your and their privacy. And things like Twitter have, have made this happen, where there's so much information about our private lives out there that we've put out there and so much information that other people put out. I don't think the fact that Google have my entire search history or my email, I mean... That data, every bit of data, I think Mike's right in that every bit of data I have is probably going to end up out there somewhere. I don't care if it's Google doing it all in one go or my friends slowly doing it or whatever else. We, it's all going to get out there. So I'm not scared of Google because if Google, uh, if Google do it all in one go or Foursquare does a bit of it and someone else does a bit, eh, it's, it's still, privacy is still dead. Well, I mean, you know, we're not scared of it because we're relatively privileged, powerful people and we have redress. The, the I, stuff I have that Daniel was talking about. Over Google. Huh? Google no, not over Google, but over, you know, over your life in general. You can live, afford to live in hotels. Who's you're not powerful? Under the thumb of a boss. Who's powerful? We are compared compared to most of the world's population. The, 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 that's that's did, ridiculous. Did you watch Dana's talk this morning? What? Did you watch Dana's talk this morning where she talked about finding the the other people on these social networks who don't have power, who are using them to try and get their stories out, um, and are, are being ignored because they're not the Well, I, I, I just I didn't think that's ridiculous. I mean, it, of course it, you do. How much, so a, how much does a computer cost? One of these netbooks is 200 bucks, right? How much does a Twitter account cost? Nothing. You're on the network. Where's the No, uh, where's some people the get listened to more than others. You can't say that everyone gets listened to. That. I mean, like, if you tweet something, or if you write a blog post, or if you say something, then you are more powerful. Your message is more powerful than some... Um, you're sort of some person who, who just buys a $200 laptop and I, I mean, that, that's listening to That's it. like saying, you know, that there's a relationship. I mean, when Robert Scoville says something, it goes around the world 10 times fast, right? Yeah. Okay. How powerful <laughs> is Robert Scoville? Um, I, I consider him an enormously powerful man. Okay. Uh, Obama? Um, he's, he's got some power, too. I mean, he's More no Scoville, power. but he tries, right? Okay. <laughs> Mike Arrington? Are we going to do this with everybody on the internet? Because uh -huh. it's going to take all day. <laughs> Until I make my point, yeah. Yeah, you're right. In, you, you proved the point that we're all equally powerful because you've mentioned yeah, Scoville, he was Arrington, a lawyer. and Obama. He was a lawyer uh, doing whatever yeah, he was you've doing. You've just mentioned three powerful people, but na name the three people who buy the $200 laptops. You can't because they don't have a powerful voice. That's the whole point. Yes, okay. those three people, have their voices get heard more, by you included. So this is the digital divide argument? No, no, it's not digital divide argument. Um, the point is that we don't see a problem with this because we've accepted it and made ourselves public, but largely, and, and we've surfed it to a way that you know, we do well but, in, in but people, conferences in yeah, Paris I, and stuff. I think that the point, we, I mean, we're, we're not my, a great sample. 
I mean, for Mike to say that privacy is dead is... I don't, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, well, Scott McNeely said it about 10 I years ago. I don't care what Scott McNeely said. I mean, the, the, the reality is Eric that Schmitt for 99% of people in the world, privacy is the thing in itself. It's the thing that defines them. So if we're going to sit here and say privacy is dead, because pri privacy for us, which we define on our own terms, and we give out the info that we want to. Well, the thing, that, the thing that this man invented uh, created a channel of public utterances that trained a whole bunch of people uh, to the idea that they could essentially model their own personality and start to create uh, information of some type that, you know, Facebook is trying to unlock from their 350 million people. So if this is, you know, obviously this is an extremely valuable quantity that is entirely under the direction of people who have no power and no influence and no followers who build those networks by aggregating them and overlapping them with other somewhat more powerful people till they get to a point where they have some visibility. That is not an undemocratic no. uh, environment. I'm not saying that's an undemocratic thing. What I'm saying is there are people who have legitimate fears about using this stuff that we don't have because we're, we're relatively insulated, insulated from them. That, that's what I was right. saying. Well, I, I, um, I agree with Mike. I don't think that we should be you know, afraid of it because I mean, it's reality. Dana, you know, Dana argued the, the other point, too, was that it used to be that wife beating was seen as a private matter, and now we, we assume that that's something we should intervene in, but we don't intervene in what we see in these public spaces. Um, ex we don't try and help people who are calling out for help on social networks or on Twitter. Uh, Jack, I want to ask you a question. Uh, I think uh, in your interview with uh, Loic, you touched on this where you said uh, that this was a surprise to you what happened, right? The, the volume and the velocity of this was Absolutely. extraordinary, right? And I think we're all continue to be surprised, all the less so because it, it keeps happening uh, as this thing keeps building out. Do you think there's going to be something that's going to come along uh, at the same kind of, and I use this word not pejoratively, arcane idea that you had, you know, connected with SMS, which is something I never used until my daughter started overwhelming uh, the account, you know, that, and that you somehow saw these connections. Do you see, are we going to see another explosion of data and the value of that data expanding like Twitter, or is Twitter going to be sort of like the windows for the next five years. <laughs> I hope it's not going to be the windows for the next five years. Um, Are you sure? <laughs> I, I, I would say uh, absolutely. I, I think we'll see, we'll see another boom. I think, uh, I think Twitter is a foundation. I think it's an evolution of communication and technology. Um, and like, like was said in this conference earlier, an iteration. Um, and, uh, and something that will be built upon. Um, uh, for you know my own new company, I was able to use this foundation of Twitter and with with 99 characters launch launch and announce our company with no PR engine or, or anything. So uh, I, I think there will be another spark, and it's it's all about mixing technologies and, and mashing them up and see what you get out of it. All right, just around, uh, once around and then we're out of here. Uh, Paul Carr, any surprises in the next year, like the way Twitter came out of nowhere? Um, you're asking me to predict surprises. Yes, I am. Um, let me put it this way. If there are any surprises, I will be very surprised. Um, that's sort of the nature of surprises. Um, What's your gut? My, my gut is there will be surprises. Some of them will be pleasant. Do you think location? Do so. you think location's, you know, I, I think location's, a big deal? I think location's big. I think um, I'll be very unsurprised if, if uh, Google by Twitter. I've heard rumors both from Belgium and from Andrew Keane. Uh, I think Jack's face said it all. I mean, we'll ask him if he has any surprises in store also. Um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be surprised if there were no surprises. Gabe. <laughs> I, I predict you'll read it first on Tech Me. <laughs> Nikolai. Yeah, my surprise, I think privacy is going to come back from the dead <laughs> next year. I think Andrew Keane's going to go all out on privacy. Get naked, be out there. Okay, so you guys have just thrown complete softballs at a serious question. No, so, so, sorry, sorry. I, I actually, I actually, um, 
I, I think it. I think we're. I think we are going to see one. Uh, one big surprise in Europe next year. I don't know who. I think it was. Um, it was Tariq who mentioned it earlier around Nokia. I think they're going to come back from the almost dead. It's going to be at the very end. They're going to finally start looking at being vertically integrated, like a company like Apple is or, or Palm. So, I hope that's going to be the pleasant surprise for much of Europe. Kevin, I think we're going to see. Um, the, the open standards thing, again, is going to come through and enable us to connect bits together we weren't, we weren't ready for and weren't expecting. Um, it, and it may be some of the geographic data, it may be your call history, it may be your SMSs. Some, some will be merged with, with some of these other stuff we're doing and we'll go, I hadn't thought of that at all. What happened there? Um, because we've been gradually working out ways to, to move this data around, suddenly we'll have some of it within our own control again Somebody like Jack will say, oh, what if I mix this with this? And we'll, and we'll all be amazed again. Okay, Loic, any big ideas in the next year? I'd like to thank you guys for just being here, all of you. <laughs> really. Okay, we're being thrown off. I, so I, the, the big trend, was that, a, was that a way of saying we're, we're done We're above right six now? minutes. You can go again for two hours more or something. I, see, I don't know. That's, that's passive-aggressive French. I don't know if that means get off stage now or if that means wrap it up. Or I, I actually don't know what it means. <laughs> It means that. It means, okay, well, we're done then. Okay. That's American passive aggressive. This is the, uh, I'm Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang. I want to thank everybody who showed up and especially those who didn't. Bye-bye. And we hope to see you next year, uh, Gilmore Gang. Thank you all. You can stay here.